Global Malice reports on the life and continued influence of the late North Korean leader Kim Jong-il. He spoke with author and media consultant Cole Stryker at Housing Works Bookstore Cafe in New York City for an hour and 15 minutes. Hey everybody, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Cole. Um, we have a couple of great books here on sale. Uh, Dear Reader, which is the book that we're celebrating tonight, is something that I finished earlier this week and found completely captivating. And I hope, I'm glad to see you all here, and um, I'm sure that that'll be illustrated in tonight's talk as well. Um, the Man of the Hour, uh, our dear writer, Michael Malice, is someone that I met at the release party of this book that I wrote, Hacking the Future. Um, we got to know each other because he spent the entire night chatting up my mother, who was visiting New York uh, for the first time. And um, uh, from what I understand, Michael, um, being Soviet-born, um, basically wanted to learn more about what his parents went through uh, growing up under Soviet rule and decided to take a trip to North Korea. And he bought every book of propaganda he could find, presumably all of these written by Kim Jong-il, the former uh, ruler of North Korea, and um, you know, col uh, collated that into a pretty interesting book. Um, and uh, he pitched it around, and nobody understood it, so he decided to put it out himself. Um, and very successful Kickstarter later, he self-published, and um, you know, now you have the, f the finished product. Um, Michael has been ghostwritten, I'm sorry, not ghostwritten, I've made that mistake before, co-written. Um, his name appears on the cover of the book, so that means he's a co-author. Um, he is a co-author of several books. Uh, he has written alongside UFC champion Matt Hughes. He's written for the comedian D.L. Hughley and um, musician Brett Michaels, who a lot of you might know better as a reality TV star. Um, so he decided to turn his, at his attention to someone who could realistically be called the most mysterious man in the world um, up until his death a few years back. And um, uh, I've, I finished the book, like I said, about a week ago. And it's kind of a comedy and it's also a tragedy. And it starts off with the phrase, I remember the day that I was born perfectly, no comma, um, which I think sets the tone pretty well for the rest of the book. Um, it's, it's a book that makes you constantly question, is this guy crazy? Um, is he that self-deluded that he actually believes these things that he's saying and that are being said about him? Um, or is he that just that cold and calculated and removed from humanity that um, it doesn't phase him the fact that his entire country is failing and starving and dying? Um, so, it's, it, like I said, it starts off really funny, though, because he, there's all these stories about how he's performing these kind of miraculous things. And, um, you know, the, w when, when he's born, the sun shines down and parts a storm. And, you know, he climbs a tree at age three. And he surprises all the adults around him with his magnificent intelligence. And you know, he, he almost he reminded me of, like, a tiny little chubby Eric Cartman running around. <laughs> <laughs> encouraging his friends to criticize themselves and tattling and ingratiating himself with the right people. And, uh, and then over time, he gains more and more power and being the son of Kim Il-sung, um, the leader of the revolution, um, of course, uh, eventually develops ultimate power. And it, it starts off kind of rosy and he's making all these changes and he's you know, leading groups and building things and after a while, it, it kind of starts to fall apart and turns from a comedy into a dark comedy. And, um, you know, you have this tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance on display where things aren't going the way that he envisioned. And it's not because it was a bad idea in the first place. It was because they're not doing the bad idea hard enough. And, um, you know, then the, the dark comedy uh, over time turns to tragedy and you start to see um, references to some pretty troubling things like um, the one that sticks out in my mind are the little sparrows which is the, the Korean word that they use for um, these little kids that are orphaned and starving and basically spend their lives um, rooting around in garbage pits trying to find anything edible, bark or grass or, and uh, of course none of this has anything to do with 
poor leadership or, or the system of government, it's all because there are these unseen uh, enemies of the revolution that are preventing them from achieving greatness. So it's, it's an amazing book, and I encourage everyone to pick up a copy. We only have a handful, but um, you can get it on Amazon, um, and I encourage you to do so. So um, without further ado, I'm going to welcome our dear writer, Michael Malice, up to the stage. Okay. So I remember the day that I was born perfectly. This is something Kim Il Jung presumably said. No, no, no. So k- k- that said about him. All the funny lines come from me. So oh, uh, okay. <laughs> how I uh, how I wrote this book, you know, I I read all the Western books about North Korea and armfuls of North Korean propaganda, and if you think communist propaganda is boring, you're wrong. It's ten thousand times worse than boring. Uh, because boring, you can kind of grit your teeth and get through it. And these stories are almost designed to kill the consciousness of the reader and eliminate critical thoughts. So I had to, you know, make it humorous, make it compelling, make it interesting. So there are these little bits of wit, but he is not a very uh, witty figure at all. Uh, everything is said with complete, utter sincerity. Uh, there's not, they're not fans of irony in North Korea whatsoever. Uh, certainly not with regard to the leaders who are regarded as some sort of secular religion. Right. So how did you decide when to insert your own you know, flourish, hum- humorous flourish? Well, the job of any co-author is, you know, when I work with any of my clients, it's kind of like being a defense attorney. Uh, I'm helping the person tell their story in the most clear, coherent way possible and the creative narrative that you know any reader could follow. I like to call it like writing novels about people who happen to be real. Um, so with this, I, I very much tried to stick to his own verbiage as much as possible. Uh, again, I tried to build a narrative that's fun and interesting to follow, and, and I've, I've gotten very positive response. Uh, because a lot of this stuff, you know, there's pieces here, there's pieces there. It's, it's, they're very much intent on obfuscating the truth, uh, North Korea, both internally and for external purposes. So there were no books out there. This is a huge hole in the market, I felt, uh, to start thinking like a capitalist, that if you want to sit down and read about North Korea and understand their philosophy and understand how they are the, why, why they are the way they are, there aren't any books like that out there. There are, there are some superb books out there that are just very, very dark, very, very depressing with good reason. Uh, So I wanted to take a lighter kind of perspective and at the same time, you know, when you're getting the sugar, you're getting the medicine and realizing this is the big humanitarian crisis of our time. So speaking of lightheartedness, um, one of the most interesting things about North Korea to me as someone who writes about the internet is that North Korea has become this almost kind of a joke to the West. And as I understand it, this is something that you wanted to attack uh, head on um, to, to demonstrate that you know that yes there are some things that are kind of humorous to us as outsiders but also this is a, a literal modern day holocaust taking place and so we have to temper any humor that we find in this by you know recognizing these these horrors right like any good Eastern European Jew I have a very dark sense of humor a very gallows sense of humor and I think that that is applied in America and the West to North Korea because I don't think people understand just how bad it is. Uh, they understand, you know, that these people have this wacky views about Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung and they understand that it's kind of a regimented society, but they don't understand things like everyone in the country every week has to stand up in front of their peers and be criticized and then they have to denounce their colleagues and if you don't say anything that's really bad. Uh, and that everyone's, you know, every minute of your day for your entire life you're, is kind of regimented and you're told what to do. Uh, and that, you, don't, you know, things like you don't have access to food because of what your grandparents were doing 50 years ago, uh, little moments like this, people don't realize just how uh, dark and, and uh, this regime really is. So when they laugh, I, I would hope they're laughing from an informed place as opposed to laughing at a sideshow. Mm-hmm. It, it's almost kind of genius when you take a step back and look at the oh, mechanisms. That's, that's, oh, I thought you were going to talk about me. Oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> the, the, the mechanisms by which uh, the regime prevented any sort of dissent. 
you know, you when you're punished, it's not just you being punished. It's three generations. It's you know, your family gets sent to the enlightenment camp. Right. Um, you know, the the, the self criticism sessions, which were which presumably were invented when Kim Jong Il was in grade school. Is that well? That, that's the claim that right. Kim Jong Il invented these criticism sessions when he was in uh, elementary school because true comradeship lies in criticism. If you don't criticize your friends, then they're going to fall victim to liberalism and spare time, which is of course the bane of the revolution. Uh, I think they borrowed it from the Chinese actually, but they they've stuck to it where the Chinese have not. We throw around the term Orwellian a lot, but yes. As, I'm, as I read through this book, you see these, these methods of uh, stifling any sort of thought that is not sanctioned by the regime that I feel like is straight out of 1984. It's completely unprecedented, and it, it is straight out of 1984. There's you know, that famous anecdote in 1984 where the protagonist has to go through the newspapers and edit out any past references that contradict the current narrative. We were always at war with Eurasia, right? And I found the same thing in the North Korean propaganda because I got books that were published in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and through today, the, all the great hits. Uh, and you'll find in an early story, it'll say, Kim Il-sung went to India to meet with the prime minister. And the same story will be told in a later book. And it'll say, Kim Il-sung went to a foreign country to meet with the head of state. So the facts just fall away, and you can see them consciously trying to put North Korea into a fog. I, I've spoken to refugees about what it's like there, and they don't teach them geography. They are, you know, it's, it's it, how ubiquitous in American and Western schools is the world atlas and, you know, learning about Europe and Africa and, and South America and all like that. They are taught about China, Japan, the U.S., uh, and, you know, South Korea and Russia, and that's pretty much it. So... You, it's absolutely pervasive their thought, their attempts to control the minds of the populace. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier something along the lines of that this is like a secularized divine right of kings scenario where everything that the regime claims becomes gospel and reality almost bends toward those claims. Like right. it's not what you're seeing. There's a story in the book about. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly, but the mountain that... Not Pictou. Pictou. You have to pronounce it like that. They okay. always have this sing-songy thing. Well, uh, this is the mountain that is just the, the greatest pride of any North Korean. And, um, or any Korean. R right, because they don't consider it to be North Korea. Right, and it's the ancestral home of all the Korean people. Right. And there's a story where Kim Jong-il asks this question of his advisors about... What, what's the highest mountain in the world? And someone says, Mount Everest? And he says, no, you're wrong. It's actually Mount Peg 2. And the reason why is because height shouldn't be measured by actual height, but rather like the spiritual greatness of... Yeah, because Mount Peg 2 is the birthplace of the revolution, therefore it's the highest mountain in the world. And it is absurd, but you have to imagine what it's like growing up in a country where this is what you're taught as your reality and even if you, like I met a refugee and there's a very another story in, in Dear Reader uh, which I talk about which they repeat ad nauseum this brilliant moment where Kim Jong Il's in kindergarten and his teacher's teaching him one plus one is two and he goes no that's not correct and she's like what do you mean little Kim Jong Il and he goes well if I have a drop of water and I add it to another drop of water I have a big drop of water not two drops you know therefore one plus one sometimes equals one and if all the Korean people put their minds together, it'll be the greatest force in history. And the teacher goes, what? Yeah, oh, she's <laughs> amazed. She's like, You're, what a genius, you know, but in between tears. And I met a refugee and I asked her about this and she, in first grade, was hearing this story and she goes to herself, this is the most ridiculous thing I ever heard, right? And, but she had the presence of mind to keep her mouth shut because if you start challenging these things, they are coming for your family. This is going to get back to your mom and your dad. So you very, very early on have to have your blinders on, head down, mouth shut. A and a lack of freedom, you know, what that means is you're just kind of in this bunker mindset where you just don't notice anything. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of these videos on YouTube where um, people go there and, and the, the guides, you know, everyone when you visit North Korea as a guide, 
the guides tell them these absurd uh, things. They ask them, like, there's this very Vice video, you know, they go to this banquet hall, no one's there, and he asks the waitresses, he goes, where is everyone? The waitresses, oh, they all just left. And it's like, you know, how crazy they are. But the fact is, for them to say we don't have any customers is criticism of the restaurant and the regime. So you have to pretend everything's great, you know, just like any hostage. If you ask a hostage, you know, if you, if you got a hostage a videotape, you, you don't ask the hostage, why do you have bruises on your face? They're, they're, they, they are not in a position to say, because the guy who kidnapped me is beating me. So it, that's where a lot of these, you know, absurd claims are coming from. They have guns to their head, these people. Yeah. There's these stories all throughout the book where Kim Jong-il will make some claim and about a field that he never have a possibility of having expertise in, like engineering or music. Or oh, yes. there's, a, there's a scene where he creates a new form of opera. That's true. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, the, the head of opera or whatever says... You know, Kim Jong Il suggests like, why don't we do it this way? And then the head of opera kind of scratches his chin and goes, you know, it's, "I've never thought about that. Yeah, it, j- it just might work." And, a, you know. a lot of these stories only work if you are under the presumption that everyone in North Korea is learning disabled, because here's how they work. It's not like Kim Jong Il goes to a school and teaches the kids. He will meet with the best experts in North Korea in that field. And he will say a completely obvious idea, and they will all exclaim, we never thought of this. And it's like, these are people working in this field ostensibly for decades. Like, a good example is they built something called the Tower of the Juche Idea, which is the tallest obelisk in the world, which, uh, even though it looks exactly like the Washington Monument, is actually inspired by Korean architecture, supposedly, right? And the story they tell is, all these architects are brainstorming how to make this building, and they go, we want to make it the second tallest our, uh, our obelisk in the world, and Kim Jong Il goes, "We should make it the tallest." And they're like, "Oh my, we never even considered that." And it's just like, really? Like, and but this is what's presented with a straight face. To make him that great, everyone else has to be knocked down a peg. And in fact, that has pernicious consequences because the the regime and Kim Jong Un currently can claim with a straight face that the leader is working hard as much as he can, but it's the ruling regime that are not putting his brilliant ideas into practice, and that's why you're hungry. And in fact, they will say that the reason Kim Jong-il has those sunglasses is because his eyes are bloodshot from staying up all night working for the people. Now, let's talk about the average North Korean. And I think that a lot of people, when Kim Jong-il died, watch these videos and they see just the crying and the relentless, you know, w- women just absolutely overcome with grief uh, that this guy died. What are we really seeing in these videos? Right, so Kim Jong-il actually, you know, kind of addressed how the people felt about him. His father uh, was in charge of North Korea for something like uh, close to 50 years. Uh, and all the refugees still venerate and love Kim Il-sung, the great leader. Uh, it, he's like, it, it, and Kim Jong Il to the great leader is like Nancy Sinatra to Frank Sinatra. No one regards the second one as anything other than a function. The first, and the first one is head and shoulders, you know, ab- above the other one. So, you know, when he was, when he took over in '94, when Kim Jong Il took for, for his father, the people, you know, had to follow suit and pretend they revered him as much as they revered his dad. It was it, a completely uh, unanimous vote, by the way, it right? It was a unanimous mm-hmm. vote. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, he has the support of the people. Um, but <laughs> and his campaign slogan was, do not expect any change from me. That literally was what all the billboards said when he took over. Um, but there's a secret tape recording of him, and he said... All this cheering is fake. They're not cheering from the bottom of their hearts. So he knew damn well that these people were not sincerely, you know, affectionate toward him. The the morning when his father died was very, very sincere. If you have anyone running your country 50 years, you're going to be terrified if only what's going to happen now. But when Kim Jong-il died, they were that was fine. But again, being in a surveillance society where all your neighbors are reporting on everything you do every week, you damn well better make a show of how sad you are. Uh, you know, when the, the deer leader dies. Yeah, so uh, when you've talked to these refugees, um, is there some, some level of deprogramming that has to happen? Or uh, are they immediately, as soon as they hit the shores of some other country, thank God I'm out of here, that was insane, uh, you know, everything about that experience was 
was br brutality and, and horror. One of the worst things about North Korea is people think that if the regime vanished, everything's going to be fine. It's not going to be fine for decades. These people have never seen a computer. They have no idea of history. Uh, you know, there's some funny anecdotes, you know, of like refugees in Seoul going up to an ATM and wondering how a person fits in there, you know, things like this. Uh, but this is, we have a nation of 24 million people. Um, uh, because they don't understand how computers work and they right. just assume that there's a little man Right, there's got to be a guy the in there, machine. you know. Uh, and they're treated with, with great contempt in the South. They have to work on their accents, which are regarded as very low class and, 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 uh, and you know, treated with contempt. Um, so it, it's a very kind of a, uh, there's no kind of happy ending um, to North Korea. Do the South Koreans want Reunification? Do they want the regime to collapse? The, cer certainly no one wants the regime to collapse, but they, reunification is less and less a priority for the South. And that is another kind of, a lot, we were even seeing some people from the North repatriate to the North after escaping, because in the South they are not able to hold down jobs, they're used to all their lives being told what to do, so they show up late to work, you know, they have chips on their shoulder because they're treated as second class citizens. So it's really, uh, a, a, it's, it, it, I mean, this regime has been, you know, s a vampire on these people for 70 years, and, you know, when the vampire is dead, you're still not going to be a healthy individual. So it, it's even darker than that, but again, the book's very funny. <laughs> it is, that's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kim Jong-il's not a huge fan of the U.S. Oh, no, no. So, so Kim jong <laughs> One of the other Orwellian things that they do is you can't refer to Americans or Japanese. It's always Japanese devils or U.S. imperialists. So even the language is used as a technique to turn people against the enemies of, um, uh, uh, of the regime. And in fact, there's this video I watched. There was a Canadian reporter. He went to North Korea. And he was walking down the street with his guides, and he got punched in the face by this elderly North Korean man with good reason because A, the elderly North Korean man probably assumed he was American, but the Americans were the fault, were blamed for the famine. So we can't have food because the Americans have an embargo. So this man, in his mind, you know, caused the starvation of his family. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, the, the book is partitioned by these various interactions with the U.S. Yes. over the years. And each interaction with the U.S. goes something like this. <laughs> it goes a little something like this. <laughs> the U.S., uh, you know, decides that they want to encroach in some way or um, monitor something, you know, f nuclear activity, um, whatever it is. And the North Koreans have to capitulate because they have zero power. Right. And this is somehow spun through this doublespeak that into a North Korean victory. Oh, yeah. So could you give an example of that? Like there's several in the book that I'm thinking of. Well, it, it's really kind of great because they constantly are, uh, you know, any regime, you have to have the other. Like if we let down our guard, they are going to come in here and invade. Like what is true is in 1861, the U.S. General Sherman went to Korea, the first you know, Western country to visit Korea. And what is also true is the Koreans killed everyone on board and burned the ship down. So Korea was known as the Hermit Kingdom long before it was North Korea. It was very, very, very xenophobic. South Korea remains you know, largely xenophobic. So one of the, you know, you have, and their idea is the Americans are biding their time because every so often, you know, they want to come in and they want to take us out. And one of the great things I learned while writing this book is all the criticism of North Korea is addressed at some point in their literature. They don't sweep it under the rug. So they, you know, go after all these, you know, criticisms of them and they have answers for all of them. You know, they say, why are we going to have reunification? Like, how can you believe all these things? And the re they, the, from their perspective, which is not completely crazy, they went nuclear because President George Bush went on TV and had basically a kill list of Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. And they're like, look, if you go after the countries that don't have nukes, like Iraq, and the countries that do have nukes, like, like, you know, like Iran is increasingly happening, you negotiate with them. So of course you're going to give us an opportunity you know, to acquire nuclear weapons. Weapons, and this is a great triumph for us. Has your opinion of American for foreign policy changed at all since you started researching this? Uh, <laughs> um, I am not a particular fan of American foreign policy. That said, I don't think that there's any good answers 
uh, with American foreign policy vis-a-vis North Korea. A huge percentage of the country is underground. They 100% have nuclear weapons. They 100% would use them if they needed to, if they felt they needed to. Um, so there's no, but again, a lot of times, you know, America will do things that are horrible and then after the fact will be called to task and it, it's, no one from any country likes to be invaded and have children killed by drones in the name of democracy. So it, it's, it's, there's some, I think Americans, and I hate criticizing Americans being an immigrant, but I, I think people often don't realize how things look from the other perspective. And somehow it's not unpatriotic to be like, you know, if I were an Iraqi and I, I had killer robots from the sky killing my kid, I might not, you know, be w- waving the stars and stripes. So if you were Obama... Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and let's say tensions escalate and Kim Jong-un says, you know, we're going to continue to, you know, brutalize our our citizens. They're going to, br- they, they well, boast about what they do. Yeah. Right. Well, let me just say one more thing. In, in their double speak, they will say human rights, you know, because they're criticized for human rights abuses, right? And they say with a straight face, human rights in our definition means national sovereignty. So when you criticize us and what we do to our people, you are violating Korean human rights. And isn't it also about um, how they perceive the people that they uh, abuse to not be human? So right. any, anybody that is thrown into a prison is by definition a class... Class enemy. And as right. Kim Il-sung, the founder, said, class enemies have to be exterminated. That's the word he used, exterminated to three generations. So according to the Juche idea, the philosophy of North Korea, and to Can most... Can you talk a little bit about the Juche sure. idea? Sure. According to the Juche idea and just, you know, most hardcore communist philosophy, you only have a right to life as a, as a member of society. It's society that grants you this right. And once you betray your society, you're an unperson and you can be vanished and, and destroyed. Now, the Juche idea, they, they very much tried to make uh, you know, Korea unique in every single way. So the Juche idea is their ruling philosophy, and, and it's an amalgam of you know, mysticism, communism, fascism, and, and kind of imperialism. And basically what Juche translates to is that which Kim Il-sung likes. It's often you know, described as self-reliance, but it's also, you have Juche gymnastics and Juche acrobatics and, and, and Juche and literature. And it, it can basically change according to the whims of... Right, and, and, right, and the definition of Juche changes, and, and you, you know, we, we talked about him inventing the opera, reinventing the opera, it's like, you should know what Juche opera is, all the definition of Juche opera is that which I like, it's, it's like, of course these people who are in the arts are crippled, and when you're, especially in, you know, in communist regimes, when you work in the arts, and you, which is a very nuanced area, when you introduce nuance into works, that's very, very, that's the you have to walk. Kim Jong-il in this book, which one of my favorite anecdotes, he really goes after the Mona Lisa. He hates the Mona Lisa. It's, it's no longer regarded as a masterpiece. And I asked my mom, who grew up under Stalin, I said, why does Kim Jong-il hate the Mona Lisa? And she pauses and she goes, because it's ambiguous. And that's exactly right. Art has to have a very clear message. If it's not propaganda, it's not art. Um, so they, the, the pervasiveness of the, and the, of the Juche idea and what they describe as the monolithic ideological system, they boast that everyone in this country thinks the same. And to them, it's a source of pride. And to us, you know, knowing what that really means, it's just a source of the most unimaginable horror. Yeah. I was... You know, reading this book personally, I, I was struck by the similarities between this policy, this attitude towards art, and the attitude towards art that I grew up with in rural Pennsylvania, surrounded by what many people might consider to be fundamentalist Christians. This idea that we have to create our own music because any music that isn't kind of furthering the cause is invalid. Right. And any any art that's ambiguous and doesn't have a specific you know, reference to the redemptive story of Christ is invalid. And I guess I just wanted to ask you about, like, did you also notice those parallels um, about, for instance, it might not be on the right, it might be left wing, this uh, tendency to demonize um, opposing ideas to the point where they're censored. 
Well, um, yeah, they're, they're not going to demonize opposing ideas because they won't be introduced to them to the populace. So you're right. just taught the one idea, and this is what you have to believe, this you have to mirror. It's funny you said that because uh, I have a good friend who lives in the Midwest. He's a you know, born-again Christian, and he said his favorite genre of music is Christian, you know, Christian music. And it's like, I don't like music that I agree with. It, it's like saying, what kind of music do you like? Love songs. It, it, th that never made sense to me. Uh, but, but again, yeah, all he says explicitly, art has to have a message. And they're not left-wing. Le this is one of the big misconceptions about North Korea. They are very, they have all the check marks of traditional fascism, except for like having business involvement in the economy. They are, they're the most homogenous country on earth. They are the most xenophobic country on earth. They are violently, you know, and anything foreign they're against. They're the fourth largest military, which is amazing given a country of 24 million. Uh, they are very militaristic, very much for strength, very much for, you know, kind of crushing the weak. Uh, they have contempt for Christianity because they will, in their, they will say that the Christian message of turning to their cheek is a trick to get people to let their guard down and to bring down shame to a nation. Uh, and in fact, there's a very famous story in North Korea that these missionaries come and they brand the children with crosses and acid on their face, you know, because they're just these, and, and they inject them with diseases. So, you know, the missionaries are really this kind of like sinister force. And homosexuals too. Well, they don't talk about that. Uh, there's <laughs> that one story that, that, that um, uh, where the American, in 1968, the American ship Pueblo was captured by North Korea, and according to the North Koreans, the Americans were complaining, not because of their poor treatment, but because as homosexuals, that's how they express themselves. They won't have sex with each other, because that's how they express their individuality, and Kim Jong-il says this will not be happening on our pure soil. Um, so it's a, it, again, speaking of the fascism, it's a very, very chaste, puritanical uh, country, um, and they have a caste system, you know, based on, they did something, the, the Orwellianism, everything that's so evil has such a great name, they had something called the Understanding People Project. Sounds great, right? I love understanding people. Who's against understanding people, right? It sounds like some Saturday morning you know, show about, hey, let's understand people. What do they do? They interviewed every single person in North Korea, and they collated what you and your family were doing up to like your second cousin. And based on that, you were granted a rating that determined how loyal you were to the regime. Uh, it's like, and it's got like 53 steps. You're not told what your credit rating is, but it determines who you marry, where you go to school, even where you live. And you can't travel within the country. You have to live where you're assigned. And the people with the bad uh, sung, sungbun, which is what the term is called, uh, we're all forced to live in the Northeast. They refuse to refer to it as a caste system. It's right? not a caste system, because that, th that goes against communism. They're like transpolitical, like they present as communists, but they're really, really, really not. And in fact, in 1980, when Kim Jong-il was um, presented to the world as the official successor to Kim Il-sung, the, the second world, the common Iron Curtain countries were like, this is absolutely insane. This goes against everything we stand for. And Kim Il-sung's like, sorry about it. Like, what are you going to do? So he... And to this day, the North Koreans get off on defiance and giving the finger to these other nations. Like people ask, what should we do? And the answer usually is this pressure China. They revel in telling China, we're not going to do what you say. You're Chinese. We're Korean. Your, your answers won't apply to us. Shut up. You know, and bring it. What do you, and, and it's really, when you have people who are digged in to that extent, how the hell are you going to get them out? So let's talk about Kim Jong-il, and this, he's sort of the lens at which you look through at the entire country. And uh, well, I'm just going to say one thing. One thing that worked out perfectly is he was born during World War II when Korea was separated into two countries. He died in 94. So it worked out that his life story works out to a history of, the Korea, of North Korea as a nation. And since he's their Forrest Gump, wherever anything happens, he's there, you know, in, involved. His by telling his life story in Dear Reader, he tells the story of North Korea. So his father, Kim Il-sung, was he sort of this, um, you know, Lenin to, I'm, I'm really going to make some wrong metaphors here, I'm sure, but was he kind of more like the true believing good guy to Kim, Il Kim Jong-il's like boy king? Uh, bad guy that took over? Well, what happened was, you know, the Soviet Union was given North Korea to kind of run after World War II, and they needed to install, like, a puppet, and they didn't have that many options um, because, you know, communism did not have a strong hold in, in, in the north of Korea at the time. So they settled on Kim Il-sung, who was this kind of ragtag revolutionary. In fact, rumor has it they had to teach him how to speak Korean again because he's always speaking Russian uh, growing up, and they thought he'd be a malleable 
kind of figure like most of these other you know puppet dictators but he was not you know he he very much had ideas of his own he had these hardcore korean national ideas nationalist ideas so uh and you know after the Korean War, Stalin died and Khrushchev took over. Khrushchev very much liberalized the Soviet Union, and this did not sit well with Kim Il-sung at all. In fact, that's why I have Khrushchev on Kim Jong-il's official enemies list. They despise him. They despise this idea of closing down gulags you know, and allowing internal migration and a kind of external news. And the point they make to defend Kim Jong-il taking over is, look what happened with Stalin. You let in some jerk after and you bring down the revolution. I've got my father's blood. I will see things through and make the revolution conclude through the generations to the end. And in fact, one of the things they have, they have something called, they have a Ten Commandments. There's Ten Commandments that run North Korea. It's not the Constitution, which is a Western artifice for, you know, for appearances purposes. And number ten is the Korean Revolution will be followed through through the generations. So, you know, this dynastic succession is in there, and it speaks to their fascist obsession with pure blood. Since this family has the blood of Mount Pic too, you know, in their gene, in their veins, they are the only ones who can really bring Koreanists to the world. World. But there's this weird paranoia every time that succession is brought up where it's like, oh, well, we're not, it's not a dynasty, it's not, you know, th these people were voted in, and, but clearly they weren't. I mean, why even pay lip service to, to this idea that there was some sort of fair uh, election or... Well, it's, it, they, it's not a fair election, no doubt, but it's a fair uh, choice from their perspective because the best man got the job. And just ask him, I mean, is there anyone better in North Korea at architecture? You saw those guys. They wanted to make the second tallest st stone tower. I mean, they will tell you with a straight face that Kim Il-sung can literally walk on water, that he can teleport. Uh, I asked the refugee, I'm like, was this a metaphor? Was he, like, fast moving with his troops? She's like, no, 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 he could teleport. And she believed that if he signed his name, like, his, the signature can lift off off the page and fly through the air. So, uh, you know, it's very much follows the Christian idea that, you know, why was it Christ that was following God? It's just like, well, who else is it going to be? It's not going to be, you know, John the Baptist. You know, he's not divine born. Kim Il-sung, the father, is invoked throughout the book um, long after his death as being this kind of, you know, person that we all owe a great debt to. Um, and Kim, Kim Jong-il is obviously doing everything for his memory and to continue his legacy and his vision. And he's still the president. He's well, the president even in death. So what is, what is the kind of purpose of Kim Il-sung as an idea right now in North Korea? Uh, I think Kim Il-sung has the same purpose in North Korea in a twisted way that the founding fathers do here. So it's this, you know, I have him make the joke that you all in America make fun of Kim Il-sung being so amazing, but you all believe that the greatest minds in history were all localized in the 17th century in 13 rinky-dink colonies, you know, on the Atlantic Ocean. So the idea is that he saved Korea, a tiny country, they boast about this, they call themselves a shrimp among whales. He defeated the, the Jap devils during World War II single-handedly. He defeated the U.S. imperialists during the Korean Liberation War, and he was the one who kept all these enemies at bay for decades. Uh, and, the, you know, the enemies are just waiting at any moment, and, and if it, but for him, you know, Korea would be part of China or part of Japan or something like that. And look at South Korea, they'll point out, where, you know, the women are being given AIDS by the AIDS-ridden soldiers we send over there so we can use the Koreans as guinea pigs. Um... One question that I had in my mind the entire time I was reading this book is, is Kim Jong-il a madman? You know, is he so far down deep into this delusion that he is essentially the messiah? Um, or is he just this cold, calculating, you know, villain of history? Well, we, we know he's not a madman because madmen don't tend to be able to execute their ideas very well for that long. So if you look at the history, all these other nations fell away, including the, the mothership, the Soviet Union, and North Korea is still plugging along. You know, If you are willing to let 10% of your population starve uh, rather than lose your grip on power, I don't know that that's 
crazy as much as it is pure evil. I mean, he did this consciously and with intentionality. He refused to let the UN see how bad things were doing. He refused to let people have food via, you know, uh, you know, other programs, foreign programs, because he said if people are getting food from abroad, they won't need the government anymore, and then we'll be, you know, out of luck. So he was very, very conniving. And in fact, he only got his leadership position because he was so conniving. It was not at all a given that he would take over, but he worked the system, kind of Game of Thrones style, uh, and he held on, you know, white knuckling till the very end. What everyone was predicting uh, in the West and even in the East that he was not going to last long after Kim Il Sung. Kim Il Sung, you know, was this charismatic man of the people. Kim Jong Il only ever spoke one sentence in public, was a recluse. So, you know, he, in every sense, the son was the inferior of the father. I guess like Arianism, and you know, he did what he needed to do, and he stayed through the end. Um, so what does this say about the, the, the method of North Korean uh, perpetuating this regime? Uh, you know, wh why did it work? You know, it's, it obviously didn't work in terms of feeding the people and pro there's no prosperity, there's nothing, you know, the, the, there's no in interesting inventions coming out of North Korea, there's no progress, but it, it worked in the sense that the regime has maintained power. Why? Well, I, I, Where all other hyper-communist regimes have failed, North Korea has somehow hung on this long. Well, I think uh, there's cer certain things that, first of all, the ruthlessness is really going to help. If you are going to, when, when, when in North Korea, when something bad happens to you, uh, they will take three generations of your family. You don't have a trial. Uh, they show up in the middle of the night, they take your family, you get sent to the camps. And you don't know who it was in your family that uh, got, who you know, disobeyed the regime and got you sent there. You're not told what your crime is or how long your, your stay, stay is in, in these awful places. So that's number one. Uh, it's a good way to maintain obedience by having everyone in the nation be a hostage. The fact that they've kind of crowdsourced surveillance and had every single person be a spy and everyone else is going to be extremely useful. Uh, and the fact that they, you know, I have him in the book boast about censorship in the same way as, look, we have the Juche idea. All these other ideas are now known to be false and outdated. You don't have rotten food in your cupboard, right? So this isn't censorship, it's progress. So the fact that these people have no exposure to outside ideas, which the communist countries always did. Uh, one of the famous anecdotes, and, and my mother can attest to this, is that it was shows like Dynasty in Dallas that brought down the Soviet Union because the women are watching how the poor people on these shows are living and they don't have toilet paper and they're like, what, what is this nonsense? I don't want this. But they don't have that option in North Korea. The only movies they're allowed to see, and that's only if you're at the very high levels, are like Titanic, which is clearly a disaster of capitalism, and like Dickens and, and, and books like Jenny Gerhardt, which is just this depressing naturalism. So they are very much unlike any other nation in the world, kept in a state of complete isolation, which is increasingly falling apart. Because when you can't feed your police force, uh, the border between North Korea and China has gotten very, very porous because they're hungry. So the people go to China, they trade things, they come back with food, they pay off the border guard. And when you don't have electricity in your entire town and, in, and dogs in China, you know, have these little lights, you're realizing what we're being told isn't true. And, and it's, very, it's a very gossipy culture. This is what happens. We have a surveillance state. Everyone talks and people are increasingly realizing this is all nonsense. Because it's like dominoes. The lie is so big and so pervasive. It's like as soon as one piece falls away, you're like, wait a minute, none of this makes sense. It doesn't add up like one and one equaling one. So in every, in every other regime that has approached this level of pervasiveness of the surveillance and the oppression... Nothing's come close in my view, but go ahead. Well, it, the ones that have come the closest anyway, you have these kind of concessions to capitalism where people start developing black markets and they're trading underground. Is there anything like that happening? I mean, you just sort of alluded yeah, to it. Yeah, th that's what's been happening now. And this is actually kind of interesting for gender issues is they have these markets because the government gave up at the late 90s on being able to feed the people through the public distribution system. So they're like, you know what? Juche means self-reliance. So you rely on yourself. Get fed. See you later. 
Um, so increasingly, you have these markets, and Kim Jong Il knew about them. He allowed them. Every so often, he'd have them shut down, uh, kind of like fumigating, so that people know who's really in charge. But it was a, a recognized mechanism of getting the people fed. And they've tried these little experiments. Uh, like there's the, the, the race on economic zone, which is a kind of a partnership with South Korea, which is very, very guarded and very kind of isolated and localized, even with the North Korea. But their perspective on economics is so uh, genuinely crazy. And, and there's a, this anecdote. Um, towards the end of his life, Kim Jong-il gave everyone in the country, it's either a 1,000 or a 10,000 percent raise. I don't remember. It was literally one of that. Everyone in the country now makes 10 times as much money. And within a month, inflation hit 10,000 percent. And he genuinely felt this was a subterfuge and people undermining his plan. And he had the finance minister shot because uh, he didn't understand why this was happening. So it's funny in a sense, but when you realize what these funny ideas happen, it means, you know, massacres and, and just vast, vast death. So we talk, but basically this, this is slowly falling apart is kind of the takeaway and that it can't last forever. Do you have a prediction? Uh, there's that famous line, I think, from Steinbeck, where he was asked, how did you go broke? And he goes, two ways, gradually and then suddenly. Um, I think it already has fallen apart. In the 90s, when the famine hit, what they referred to as the arduous march, Kim Jong-il invented his philosophy, which he called sun Goon, which means military first, which basically meant the military eats first. And under this, it was no longer the party, the workers' party that runs uh, North Korea, it's the, it's the army. And this is basically martial law. Uh, so this was a big, big change. Uh, and this was them, you know, getting even more, you know, kind of violent and, and, you know, digging their heels in further. So there is change, but it's just, it changed in, the, in some senses it's better, but in other senses they're just doubling down on the brutality. And how do you think this is going to play out, that eventually the rest of the world is going to say, hey, you got to stop this or we're going to invade? Or that the people are going to decide that they've had enough? Or uh, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who works with these issues, and he had a very good point, which is it's a great thing that Kim Jong-un killed his uncle, because now all those people at the party elites at the very top realize their days could be numbered. If he's going after his own family, I, I might not be safe. So that might be a possible opportunity. That said, if it hasn't happened for 70 years, I, I, first of all, invading, I think, is almost a, it, it will almost definitely not happen uh, for many, many, many reasons. But I, I think China wouldn't let it. Uh, Why? Well, because if North Korean regime goes down, it, you've got 24 million refugees pouring into China who don't speak Chinese, who have no skills, uh, who are hungry, and, and it's just going to be a, a complete nightmare. Uh, South Korea certainly the the border between North and South Korea is the most militarized border in the world called the DMZ. Ironically, Clinton said it kept him up at night. And there's all these landmines, you know, for, for miles and miles and miles. So th they have to go to China. Um, so invading would be a complete horror. And, and what's the worst part is all the people in the concentration camps, and you can see them on Google Earth. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just really, really, you know, just awful this is happening right now, obviously. They're all told, if we get invaded, we're going to kill all of you, and we're burning these camps down, just like the Nazis you know, kind of tried to do it in World War II. So again, you know, if you're going to invade this country, you do so knowing that immediately hundreds of thousands of prisoners are going to be murdered. So what's, <laughs> what do we do? But it's a very funny book. <laughs> what, what's the solution as, an, as any outside government, like if you were advising any of these people? The only solution I had, being a dear writer, is write a book, let people understand what's going on. They're not crazy. There is a complete logic to everything they do. Their actions are predictable and coherent. And hopefully someone will read this book and it'll get the wheels turning in the right direction because I do not have any answers. Like, how do you save a people who have been so you know, lost and oppressed for so long. I mean, the, the, another metaphor I always use is the slaves after the American Civil War were for decades, you know, it was, uh, you know, horrible for them. And not to be comparing tragedies, but in North Korea, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, at least in the South, they were in a semi-free state. This is just a complete uh, uh, nightmare system. So we, we see increasingly um, these 
media companies going into North Korea and producing documentary content. Why does North Korea let these people into the country. I mean, well, North Korea very much plays into Western um, uh, views on them. You know, a, a lot of times I'll read a book and they'll mention it, like a Western book, and they'll mention some kind of crazy North Korean news article, and I'll look in the footnotes and I'll look for the original source, only to find it's been scrubbed, meaning they read that Western book and like, okay, this is too crazy that, that all these birds were dying because the Kim Il-sung died and things like that. So they play up their exoticness and their wackiness because then, you, you know, you're nervous that this guy has his finger on the trigger, you know, kind of this Dr. Strangelove thing, and you don't want to engage with them because when someone's crazy, you don't know what they're going to do next. So they, they very much uh, kind of are aware of how they're perceived, and, and they feed into it. And they have an Instagram account. They do have an Instagram account. And they're account. following you. They, don't, they didn't follow me if they liked the book cover. They liked it. Yes. And in fact, when my friend went to North Korea, uh, they liked her picture, and she got so scared, she liked all of theirs. Um, but why, why they are letting in all these media companies is uh, they are desperate for money. Uh, they're the first communist nation to default in their loans. So they had no hard currency and they, they produce nothing of value. So they need money so they can buy gasoline. They have very little electricity. Um, so that's one of the few things that they can sell is tourism. Uh, and these are all very tightly controlled tours, of course. And from their perspective, the rest of the world wants to know in North Korea how great they are, and, and this is their way of sharing with the rest of the That's the conceit that they have to play into, that everyone's interested in them because they're so awesome, and let's let them see how awesome we really are. Tell us about your relationship with your guide. Sure. So uh, one of the most... Uh, when I work with a, a celebrity, when I co-author a book of theirs, my job basically is to kind of crack them and get in their head because they're going to give me the press release answers and I want them to tell their truth and their real story. Uh, and there's a lot of techniques I use for this and it's, it's a whole process, but whatever. So when I was in North Korea, uh, I really wanted to get inside my guide's head because I really wanted to know what she thought, how she felt, how she viewed her, uh, her country. And she reminded me a lot of my mom. You know, She was you know, young and my mom you know, would have been that age when she left the Soviet Union, even though the Soviet Union was obviously far better than, than North Korea. So it, w it was very touching because, first of all, they're very funny. People can't get their head around that. They're very funny. When I was leaving North Korea, I asked my guide, I said, if I can send you anything from the West, what do you want me to send you? And immediately she goes, a Porsche. <laughs> and they have a famous symbol, uh, Cholima, which is a Pegasus they have there. It's their symbol of speed. And I go, I'm not sending you a Porsche. And don't ask me to send you Cholima either. And she goes, we've got the original one here. Why do I need you to send it to me? So really quick, and she said, I want hand lotion, there's none in the whole country. She just wants soft hands. And she goes, I want perfume. And, I, and the person with me goes, what kind of perfume do you want? And she's struggling for the words because if you've never owned perfume or don't know anyone who's ever owned perfume, how are you going to have the language for that? She goes, I just want to smell like a girl. She's like, I just want to smell feminine. And this is, I think, you know... Listen, if, if the worst you could say about a country is there's no perfume, they've got it pretty good. But I think this is, just speaks to how pernicious and pervasive the control is. If we don't make it, uh, you don't need to have it. You don't, you don't get to have anything nice or pleasurable or little treats or anything like that. Once a year on the leader's birthdays, they'll give all the kids in the country candy and notebooks, you know, and it's supposed to be this great thing. But I think it's better when the kids can have candy as a treat, you know, whenever they want, uh, in, not in, and not in celebration of this man who's taken everything from you and your family. And that lack of perfume is not just a matter of them not having perfume, but it's also that that, that you know, using perfume would be some sort of uh, attack on this idea of sameness. Oh, yes. You have you know, this kind of tall poppy syndrome. You're standing out from the crowd, what you think you're better than everybody. You know, it, it's very much you know, frowned upon. And it's interesting because in Pyongyang, it's the highest ca to live in, to even step foot in Pyongyang, you have to have the highest level of political reliability. And many of these refugees are like, oh, what's it like? Because you know, they, they hear stories about Pyongyang. It's this miracle. It's like the, the capital from Hunger Games or something. Yeah, well, and in fact, one of my refugee friends loves the Hunger Games, and she said, it was like North Korea. She's like, how did they know? And I'm like, am I supposed to laugh? Um, it was, um, but <laughs> so so. It, it, but in Pyongyang, they they watch South Korean like TV shows and they use South Korean slang. 
uh, she taught me the term ipoyo, which means cute. And when I told the refugee, I'm like, you know, ipoyo, cute. And the refugee goes, oh, you learned that in Seoul. I go, no, 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 I learned that in, in Pyongyang. She goes, that's South Korean. So they regard themselves very much as cosmopolitan, worldly. You know, they, they're they more like New York than they are like, uh, you know, these little boondock towns. With, they've never left the country. But they've never obviously. left the country. And, they never, and it, it would, yeah, another really kind of poignant, sad moment, my friend had gone earlier. You know, he's the one who showed me that it's legal to go. Anyone can go. You know, I would encourage anyone to go because it's just amazing. And his guide at the end was like, oh, I hope you come back and visit us. I had a great time talking to you. Because to them, it's like talking to the only time to talk to a foreigner. And he goes, you know, oh, I would love it if you come visit me in Los Angeles. You know, he plays dumb. And she kind of turns around and cries, like literally. And she's like, I'm afraid that won't be possible. So uh, these people uh, know that they are trapped. Um, so again, it's, the book's hilarious. <laughs> So what's the deal with this Kim Jong-un guy? What's the deal with Kim Jong-un? Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> is he another Kim Jong-il? Is he, uh, Kim is, is he even more of this like playboy who doesn't care about anything other than you know eating expensive sushi? And Kim Jong-un was plan C. Is he Joffrey from Game of Thrones is what I'm asking. I've been told I look like Joffrey. Uh, and I don't know that that's true, but I think that's, a, that's apparently that's a bad person to aspire to. So... Again, it's not a, this. Kim Jong Il makes this point, and it's true. It's not strictly a hereditary monarchy because their eldest son was passed over. The eldest son, Kim Jong Nam, uh, went to Japan. Can we talk about why he was passed over? Sure. Uh, and, and today is Passover, so he went to Kim Jong Nam. He went to Japan. His passport, which is from the Dominican Republic, uh, his Chinese name in the passport translates to Fat Bear. Because he's this, it literally does. He's this kind of roly poly guy. Um, he he said he was going to Disneyland. He was actually there to collect money for like illegal arms shipments with North Korea is, is about. And it was kind of this joke. Uh, was this sort of his own like deal he was doing on the side? No, or was he was this a, officially a, sanctioned. There, there's a there's a report that just came out uh, today called "Illicit" by Human Rights for North Korea. It's, I encourage everyone to read it, but just shows how North Korea has their finger in all sorts of illicit activities because that's their way to generate money because they can't Kid do kidnapping and drugs and guns. Well, and guns and gun running all, and counterfeiting all this other, uh, other stuff and, and it's, it's this great report um, so Kim Jong Nam is in Japan and he got caught but he wanted to liberalize he went with Kim Jong Il on more than one occasion in Beijing dec- you know, years apart and he goes look what happened in Beijing it's great we should liberalize we'd be more like them and he goes Kim Jong Il says we're not Chinese it won't work for us if you want openness open a window so this was a big reason, and, he, and the, son, the eldest son is kind of an environmentalist, which in a communist nation is, you might as well just you know, be straight out of Burning Man. So he was passed over, right? The second son... Is he alive? He's alive. He lives in Macau. Yeah, he wrote a book about my father, Kim Jong-il. And in fact, when I went to North Korea, I had a list of books I wanted, and that was on that list. And I'm like, oh, sh-. only in retrospect, but I'm like, when he, my guide was asking for this book, uh, he must have been, uh, his heart must have skipped a beat. Um, the second son is, has a hormonal imbalance, is a sissy, and too much like a little girl. Uh, so that was a no-go. So Kim Jong-un was the only one left, and the idea was Kim Jong-il's sister, Kim hyung wi was going to be kind of the regent, guiding him through the power succession, and she is really, really, she's like Joffrey, she's really, really evil. Her daughter uh, had a boyfriend or fiancé who was of a bad class, and she drove her to suicide. So this is the kind of, uh, of ruthlessness. It's not just to the people, it's to it's like the family. It's med- like medieval. Uh, power brokering and I don't even know if medieval was this bad I mean like we think of medieval as being this bad but it, it, this is a whole new kind of th- so they're right they are new and unique because the world's never seen anything like this so Kim Jong-un very much promised to stay the course just like his father and he, and he even looks you know he's it's very much cultivating the fact that he looks like his grandfather Kim Il-sung uh, and he's very much staying the course like this Dennis Rodman kind of uh, um, fetishization is a little unusual but everything else you know he he is really not introducing any change. What's your take on this whole Dennis Rodman thing? I, I think it's amazing that we have concentration camps and people are interested in this kind of you know guy slipping on a banana uh, sideshow on the side. I I, I I almost can't talk about Orwellian. You know, I remember sending you the sending you the link to the uh, video that Vice had produced about Dennis Rodman's visit, and you were basically like, I can't watch this. Yeah, because. 
you, when you go there and you see the people and you hear the kids, you know, the, you go to the schools, right, and the kids sing a song for you and you hear that they all have chest colds because there's no heat in the school and they don't have heat at home and they don't have warm clothes and you hear it all, all day. It just, it, it still rings in my head and people just want to talk about some idiot going on a trip. It's just like I almost can't ra- wrap my head around the fact that there are concentration camps where children are being beaten to death and it's like, hey, isn't this wacky? This guy who married himself, remember that? Is friends with this person. It's like, no, this is not funny to me at all. And I'll tell Holocaust jokes all day long because the Holocaust is over. But this is happening right now. And uh, people don't get how pervasive and bad it is. How are we doing on time? Is any 15 minutes, okay. all right. So we, we used up our poignant moment. We'll have to think of something more poignant. Well, there's a lot of poignancy in the book, and, and a lot of actually, there's one of my friends had this kind of uh, a, pre, a poignant moment book, which happened in real life, which is Kim Jong Il married this woman, the love of his life, and he couldn't make it public because she was married before, she had a kid, she wasn't of good hierarchy. So his father, Kim Il Sung, is like. When are you going to get married? When are you going to give me a grandson? Not knowing that he had a grandson, Kim Jong Nam, and the grandson was being raised in secrecy, and Kim Jong Il's like, soon, dad, soon. And his father found a wife for him and forced them to get married, not realizing Kim Jong Il was married before. And that moment where Kim Jong Il had to sit down his first wife and be like, I had to marry somebody else, and you're still going to be a secret. And she was the like, biggest movie star in Korea. And the woman you know, was driven to suicidal depression and exile to Moscow to live out her life in isolation. So talk about poignancy, like the, the, the pernicious wickedness of that place affects everyone, even the people at the very top. Towards the end of the book, it, it gets very sad. And, um, and weirdly enough, I, I found myself feeling bad for Kim Jong-il. Um, and the reason why is because he, he devotes his entire life to the revolution. Um, supposedly. Supposedly. According to him, yes. Yeah, and uh, I mean, secretly, he's indulging in every luxury. No, he's actually, they're pretty chaste. Like they'd have strippers, but you weren't allowed to touch them. And certainly okay. no one was sleeping with them, yeah. Did you read the article about the sushi chef? Yes, of course, which, uh, which is not very uh, reliable. Really? Yeah, but that's a whole other long story. Okay, well, um, anyway, Kim Jong-il devotes his life to the revolution, and he can't acknowledge his son. He can't acknowledge his right. lover. Um, Wife, yeah. He, he seems like a very lonely guy. <laughs> well, I mean, it is... I mean, there's, there's that joke from the Team America movie which sort of kick-started this whole idea of Kim Jong-il as a silly internet meme. But, um, you know, he sings that song, I'm So Lonely. And it, in some ways, it seems like that may have been the case. Yeah, and that GQ article you mentioned where Kim Jong-il's personal chef kind of spilled the beans, there's that moment where he goes, do you really like me? And Kim Jong Il asks the chef. the chef, and the chef's like, "Of course." And he goes, "Well, if you don't, I'll cut." You know, he makes a motion, stabbing him in the stomach. But again, I, I, I don't have. I had to have empathy for him to write in his voice. But to be inferior of your dad, to see people cheering and knowing it's all a stage production, uh, and to knowing these people despised you, I, I'm sure uh, he was not a very happy person. Uh, I don't think human beings are happy when every wish of theirs is fulfilled. I mean, it is not a psychologically healthy place to be, but I'm sure he's in hell, you know? So, I, I, I mean, let's, let's be realistic. This guy was more than happy to let people starve just to maintain his grip on power, which is as evil as it gets. There's a moment... But it's a very funny book. There's a moment where uh, <laughs> the first son, who was kept a secret... But, uh, you know, eventually realizes that everything is a sham yeah. and that this everything is a charade and that Kim Jong-il is just full of lies and he finally confronts his father and says, like, you're, you're lying to this me. This is you're all lying. fake. And how old is the son at the time? Like, like five or six. Yeah, pretty young. Yeah. Like, what do you think is going through Kim Jong-il's head? Well, that's a great story, which is true. Uh, they let the son watch South Korean TV and Kim Jong-nam and when he was a kid and he wanted to meet the host of some children's TV show and Kim jong is like oh crap what are we going to do how are we going to produce this South Korean celebrity so they find a farmer who looks like him they give him the costume and they have him practice to be an imposter 
And at the son's birthday party, they present him as like, hey, look, it's that South Korean celebrity you like. And the kid immediately, this is all true, realizes that's not the guy. And he tells him, he goes, this is all fake. So, uh, you know, when you're, he, Kim Jong-il knows his father couldn't walk across water. He knows he was born in Russia and not in, in North Korea. He knows his father started the Korean War. He knows all these things. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's very, you know, these sociopaths, by definition, are not happy people. Uh, so he, he's, you think that he hasn't drunk the Kool-Aid to the extent that he's just as much of a believer as he thinks everyone else is supposed to be? He's not drunk the Kool-Aid. You know, because when you see him talking to Putin and you see him talking to Madeleine Albright and when you see him talking to uh, the president of China, he's very conniving, very crafty. Uh, he, this is a great story. In, in 2001, uh, you know, for decades, the North Koreans have been kidnapping Japanese citizens to, tra to help them train the North Koreans to be spies. And this is regarded as nonsense, another crazy North Korean story, but it was all true. And when the president, prime minister of Japan came to North Korea, Kim Jong-il apologized. He goes, yeah, we have been kidnapping your people for decades. Oops, promise won't happen again. It was people under me who were, you know, kind of working too hard. And he thought that this apology was going to get them aid because it's like, I came clean, you messed us up during the colonial period, give us rice. And the Japanese are like, are you crazy? And rather than give them rice, they had such a surplus of rice, they, they threw it in the ocean because they were so apoplectic that this was being, and that you had the nerve to apologize and think this apology was going to be taken at face value. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's craziness, but not in the sense that you might think. Like, he, he knows he's not magic. In fact, when he met uh, this, this, this famous actress that he kidnapped, uh, the first thing he says to her is, don't I look like a midget turd? Uh, look at my physique. So he had this, when he met Madeleine Albright, the first thing he says is, here I am, the last of the communist devils. So he had can the... You, can you tell the full Madeleine Albright story, Oh, the story, Madeleine please. Albright story. Okay. My favorite stories that I left unchanged were the ones that were true. Because you read them and you're like, oh, this is nonsense. Real quick, in, in telling this story, what did, how did you position it? Is it in Kim Jong-il's words, or is it a mixture of Kim Jong-il's words and what you know to be true from outside it, news it, stories? It's, it's right. I know it's, 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 he, he did not put the story down. It's in their propaganda. But basically, the story goes is Madeleine Albright goes to North Korea, which really happened, and she expresses her... She brings the basketball. She brings the basketball. Signed by Michael Jordan. Yes. And Madeleine Albright, according to the North... This is the first I heard of it. It was the North Korean story. She expresses her mood via her brooches. So Kim Jong-il is trying to figure is out... Is there any reference to this outside North Korean propaganda? Well, I'll get to that. So she's, you know, she shows up, she has this brooch, and then she has this one, and at one point she's so enamored with him, she has a brooch of two hearts in her locking, which is a symbol, which is a pretty international symbol of love and friendship, right? And I'm like, oh my God. I, I, so I go back to verify this story. It's all true. She wrote a book called Read My Pins about how she expresses her emotions through her brooches and there is a photo of her and him walking down the hall and she has a brooch with two hearts on it. And I'm like, I, it, that was the moment that really kind of my head exploded uh, during the book because it was just like, I, I, I didn't know, but like, you know, so much of their stuff is false and this is, everything was true. Yeah. And it starts off with a different kind of brooch, right? Right. So she showed up because everyone in North Korea has to have a brooch on at all, a pin on at all times of either the great leader, the dear leader, or both of them. Everyone in the whole country. So she shows up with this giant American flag, like the size of a playing card, to be like, screw you. A, we don't have to wear brooches, and my brooch is better than yours, and it's true. He interprets this as, as like a big power move. But it was. She said this. She said, I wanted to wear this kind of flag-waving rah, rah, rah. I mean, I'm in my red, white, and blue, you know, for the Where same purpose. Where do you purpose. get a pen like that? Uh, I mean, you're Madeleine Albright. I don't know. Uh, Area 51. So... Uh, <laughs> It's true. So, like, that story of, like, all the stories in the book, I didn't have to change at all. I had to put in the first person. But the way they tell it actually happens. Actually, no. There's one part which did not happen, but which was very funny, which is Madeleine Albright's at this banquet, and she goes, how do you count to... Uh, how do you count to 16 just using your fingers? And everyone's like, I don't know. And Kim Jong-il, huh? no one knows. And he goes like this, where your thumbs make the X, so it's four times four makes 16, and, and Madeleine Albright starts crying, and everyone applauds. Which is a weird sort of callback to his childhood experience of constantly disproving his teachers by some sort oh, of Oh, yeah. Uh, sure, yeah. that was intentional. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a clever callback. 
Yeah, all this built-in irony that I didn't know was there. And, and then, there. Wait, so there's more to this. Madeline Albright wears a third brooch. Brooch. Right, of a cowboy, right. which the North Koreans claim is the international symbol of friend of peace. And I'm like, because I've never heard this. Because cowboys promote peace. No, in the that's West. my answer. I, I'm like, I have to make some justification. They don't justify okay. anything. They're like, and sh as she left, she had a cowboy pin, which is the symbol of peace. I'm like, okay, it's not. And the dear readers of this book will know it's not. So I have to have some ostensible justification. And it was a perfect segue into the George Bush chapter. Uh, you know, and, and obviously, George Bush takes a big knock in this book, and with good reason. Why? Well, I, I think this kind of. Uh, saber rattling is not regarded uh, very well abroad and with good reason. Uh, so I, I, yeah, and, and the fact that George Bush unilaterally left many of these treaties, treaties I have the list in the book when you know, Kim Jong-il criticizes him for that like you know, the US and the Soviet Union and now Russia had this treaty since the 70s and George Bush just says, you know what it doesn't apply to us anymore. Th that kind of high handedness you know, is not in my view uh, very good international relations. What, what was the thinking behind that, you know, the, this grandstanding on, on the U.S.'s part? You're asking me why George Bush did these things? I mean, wh what do you think? Uh, I, I think he was like, I'm on the side of the angels, and I know what's right, and I'm not going to have a piece of paper such as this treaty or the Constitution bind my hands. Um, There's some irony, huh? Yeah. It's so a very funny book. Parallelisms between... I, I, I hate that. Okay, uh, when Mike Huckabee... Uh, just uh, last week said, I think there's more freedom in North Korea than in the U.S. That kind of stuff enrages me because when you realize what these people are laboring under and you realize what life is like, uh, the idea that you can compare you know, the U.S. and Korea or even Iran and Korea, North Korea is so outrageous and the fact that they're this... Like I had someone who uh, on my Facebook compare Bloomberg to Kim Jong-il. It's like when you kind of... You're invalidating 70 years of tragedy and you're invalidating people who are right now a nation of hostages. Thank you. I thought that would be a good note to end on. All right. <laughs> You can get Dear Reader on Amazon or go to KimJongYelBook.com for more info. Yes, we have a few copies over here, but we invite you to pick up a copy on Amazon. Um, check out the website, Dear Reader. Kim, KimJongYelBook.com. KimJongYelBook.com. And, and it's 100% um, true. Yes, in quotations. So we're going to open up now for some questions. Um, I, I th yes. I so what language do you communicate with? Oh, this is like the language you communicate with tour guides. So the tour guides have to, you know, each tour guide has a different language they speak. Mine spoke English. But when I was in a, uh, the museum by the DMZ, there was a tour guide there with her Russian group, and she spoke Russian. And Russians can recognize each other in a crowd. It's kind of like black people. So I go up to this, these Russian people, and I'm like, and they're like, are you going to apologize to her for being a disgusting American pig and for invading their country? And she's laughing because she knows it's a facade. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. We'll never do it again. She goes, good. Make sure you don't. So I, I, I resent enormously when people diminish the humanity of these people trying to make the best of a, the worst possible situation. Would you say that they're brainwashed? No. That they're, they're very aware of the situation they're living I, in? I, I, brainwashed is... I, I have Kim Jong-il... I love that line I have him say, which is, only in the disgusting West can brainwashing be regarded as a bad thing because they're so filthy and dirty in the West. Um, they're, they're not brainwashed because the stories don't add up and they don't make sense. You, can't, you can convince people very easily that they, they are rich. You cannot convince them they have more food on their plate than they did last year. And they've had to change their propaganda and say, you know, we're kind of building a better tomorrow, but we're poor. So there's an increasing uh, acknowledgement by the regime that uh, everything's not all it's cracked up to be. Yes. <laughs> If you have anything international, that's, that's like a, a death penalty felony. So you do not communicate with the world at all, but that's increasingly falling away because you have cell phone reception on the border, so people from the south will be calling through these brokers and they have these little codes uh, and, and talking to their family members. But they very much pride themselves on nothing foreign. If it's not Korean, we don't need to know it. 
And if you get caught with a cell phone. If you get a cell, cell phone, forget it. You know, but no, actually, one of the great things about the regime uh, not being able to feed the people is increasingly when you get caught with a crime, you can bribe your way out of it. So if you get caught with that cell phone, you could tell that person who caught you, I'll let you use it for it half the time, and that person will be more than happy to look the other way. So that's a wonderful thing is this creeping cynicism that's taking hold over there. How big is the ruling class outside of the core family. Oh, I mean, the ruling caste is probably, I think, like, like 20, 30% of the population is called the, 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 the loyal caste. Then you have the wavering caste in the middle, then you have the hostile caste at the bottom. I mean, the people who live with t modern amenities. Modern amenities is extremely small because, again, Pyongyang is the only city that has electricity in the whole country at night. If you look at the map from space, you can see it's just this black void, North Korea versus the South. So even modern amenities, how many cars in the whole country? A thousand? Uh, I mean, that's the level we're talking about. The, there's less than 100 people who are allowed to have internet access. And if you are someone who's trusted enough to go abroad, like a diplomat or something, you are going to have family members staying behind. So if you defect, those family members are going to get punished for you defecting. Yes? Uh, yes. Yes, sure. I have a question about the, the perspective that Westerners have in North Korea. Uh, John, John Chang, the Anglo Chinese writer who blogs for about five or three miles, she said that when she first came to the West, Britain, people viewed the Chinese almost as other humans. They, they didn't mind the cold, they did view them as humans. They had the same emotions and feelings. You, Yes, that's the question is, do people really regard that North Koreans as not having emotion? There was a headline article in the Daily Mail or Metro, one of these British papers, and the headline article was Kim Jong-un's mini-skirted robot army about how all these women are marching in lockstep in these parades. And when you refer to someone as a robot, you're explicitly saying this person has no feelings, dreams, or emotions of their own, and they've completely been programmed by the state, and it's absolutely false. Uh, they giggle, they gossip, they tell jokes, you know, they want to look pretty, they want to have a boyfriend, they want to do well in school, they love their mom. So, you know, any, that mindset makes it seem like the regime is effective and, and is doing its job, and thankfully the regime is not as effective as it could be. All right, that's all the time we have. Thanks, everyone, Thank for you very coming. much. We're going to be decamping to Botanica after this, which is just up the street, uh, for some drinks, if you'd like and to. And there's, like, a very few books left, so if you want to grab it. Yeah, we'll be signing. Thanks for coming. Thank you. All right, let's hear, let's hear one more time for Michael and Cole. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. There's two books left. Um, I'm sure both of our writers would be happy to sign books for you. Botanica is at 47 East Houston between Mott and Mulberry, if you'd like to celebrate your freedom <laughs> there. Um, but thanks again, and we hope to see you back at Housing Works soon. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's going to be a real one. 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 Yeah, it's going to